Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. Valentine's Day 2009, I was a freshman in college. Barack Obama had just been inaugurated as the President of the United States, and there was a crunchy layer of snow on the ground. So much was changing in my life and in our country, and yet some things like the crunchy February snow were the same. That Valentine's Day, I planned to return to something familiar while facing a momentous change in my life that was beyond my control. Rather than celebrating with my new friends at college, I drove my Honda Civic East to visit one of my best friends from home, Alyssa. I had not seen Alyssa since August, but as had been our custom in high school, we spoke on the phone almost every day. I was excited to have a sleepover with my friend like all the sleepovers we'd had before. We'd stay up late watching movies, eating snacks, and laughing so loud that her mom would have to come and tell us to calm down so she could sleep. I also approached that Valentine's Day with trepidation on the same day that Barack Obama had been inaugurated as president, Alyssa was diagnosed with leukemia. When she answered the door, I saw that her hair was gone, her energy slightly dampened, but her smile was the same. We hugged and I offered her a box of chocolates asking, will you be my Valentine? That night we gossiped and watched rom-coms, I helped her when her stomach was upset, and I drove her to the pharmacy where her mom worked nights so she could administer Alyssa's medication. I wanted so desperately to take care of her, for her to know that I cared. And I wanted so desperately for things to go back to the way that they had been just months ago. The next morning, she asked me to make her a bagel with extra cream cheese for breakfast. In my efforts to demonstrate my devotion, I loaded half a tub of cream cheese onto one bagel. Alyssa looked at the bagel and looked at me. Erica, I can't eat this, it's disgusting. We burst into uncontrollable laughter. It felt so ridiculous. This wasn't how we expected our lives to be after high school. And yet here we were, together, laughing again. The memory of that Valentine's Day is one that I cherish, one that makes me smile. It was a Valentine's Day to honor the love of two friends, a love that could withstand change, a love that helped us navigate our transition to adulthood, which was simultaneously a transition to her death and to my unimaginable grief. Leading up to this Sunday, I've been thinking about this a great deal. This Valentine's Day is a day when we can celebrate love and also a day that feels heavy with grief. In a recent episode of the radio show This American Life, host Ira Glass interviewed a woman named Cindy, whose father died in October. Ira asked Cindy if she ever heard the then presidential candidate, now president, Joe Biden, refer to the empty chair. Many of you have likely heard of this as well. The empty chair is the chair at our dining room table where our loved ones who have died used to sit. Cindy replies, yeah. My dad's date of death was October 20th, and the last debate was on October 22nd. I had heard that line. I've heard him use it before. He had said it millions of times. And then I'm sitting on my couch, And he looks at the camera, and he talks about it again after my dad died. And it truly felt like, oh, right, 
this is me now. This is my Thanksgiving. This is my Christmas. This is my son's 16th birthday. And somehow, even though I knew he had said that line hundreds of times before, I felt like he was looking through the television straight at me. I felt like he was looking at our whole family. I felt like he was looking at all of us who've lost a loved one to COVID-19. We grieve because we love, and the greatest balm for our grief is more love. In his book, A Path to Love, Deepak Chopra writes, the aching need created by lack of love can only be filled by learning anew to love and be loved. We all must discover for ourselves that love is a force as real as gravity and that being upheld in love every day, every hour, every minute is not a fantasy. It is our intended natural state. Sometimes we need to be reminded. One of my favorite prophets of love is the visionary feminist theorist, Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks begins her book all about love with this story. On my kitchen wall hang four snapshots of graffiti art I first saw on construction walls when I walked to my teaching job at Yale University years ago. The declaration, the search for love continues in the face of great odds, was painted in bright colors. At the time, recently separated from a partner of almost 15 years, I was overwhelmed with grief so profound it seemed as if an immense sea of pain was washing my heart and soul away. Overcome by sensations of being pulled underwater, drowning, I was constantly searching for anchors to keep me afloat, to pull me back safely to the shore. The declaration on the construction walls always lifted my spirits. Whenever I passed the site, the affirmation of love's possibility gave me hope. Signed with the first name of the local artist, these words spoke to my heart. Reading them, I felt certain the artist was undergoing a crisis in his life, either already confronting loss or facing the possibility of loss. In my head, I engaged in imaginary conversations about the meaning of love with him. I told him how his playful graffiti art anchored me and helped restore my faith in love. I talked about the way his dedication with its promise of love waiting to be found, a love I could still hope for, lifted me out of the abyss I had fallen into. One day on my way to work, I was stunned to find the the construction company had painted over the words with a white paint so glaringly bright, you could still see faint traces of the words underneath. After much searching, I located the artist and talked with him face to face about the meaning of love. We spoke about the way public art can be a vehicle for sharing life-affirming thoughts, and we both expressed our grief and annoyance that the construction company had so callously covered up a powerful message about love. To remind me of the construction walls, he gave me snapshots of the graffiti art. Everywhere I have lived, I have placed these snapshots above my kitchen sink. Every day when I drink water or take a dish from the cupboard, I stand before this reminder that we yearn for love, that we seek it, even when we lack hope that it can really be found. The search for love continues in the face of great odds. Almost exactly a year ago, Reverend Kim and I facilitated a workshop on writing our Unitarian Universalist elevator speeches, which is what you would say if you just had a short elevator ride to answer that question we receive time and time again, what is Unitarian Universalism? Kim and I were pleasantly surprised to see how many of you attended. As we pulled out more and more folding chairs and the circle widened, the conversation took off. Kim and I shared examples of elevator speeches and quickly people began to share their own. While our responses were personal and based on our own experiences and spiritual journeys, there was one thing that we all agreed upon that day. 
Unitarian Universalists believe in the transformative power of love. We believe in love that transforms our lives and our world. Now, the tricky part here, which some of you might have already caught on to, is that defining love is perhaps even more challenging than defining Unitarian Universalism. Love is subjective. Love is a noun and a verb. Love is commodified and commercialized. Love is emotional, behavioral, spiritual. To put it plainly, love is complicated. In the same way that we develop our own elevator speech to define our faith, we also weave together a definition of love based on our lived experiences, the wisdom of prophetic people, and our hopes and desires. Our love journey and our spiritual journey are intertwined, just as our spirituality evolves and changes throughout our lives, taking us to new sources of truth and wisdom and helping us survive and make meaning of deep suffering. Our love journey evolves and changes as well. We find love in moments of ecstatic joy, deadening grief, and mundane reality. Throughout life, there is the promise of hope, the promise of love, the longing for connection, affection, care, and understanding. As Unitarian Universalists, we come from a legacy of people who affirm that love is more motivating than fear. Our choices and our actions are motivated by our love for one another and our love for the divine, rather than fear of retribution. Love for ourselves and others transforms us, sustains us, and allows us to be resilient in times of stress and change. We need it now more than ever. Time and time again, we are reminded that love is the foundation of life. Love and our search for love propels us forward, draws us together, and breaks our hearts open. It is love that calls us on to change and eliminate what is cruel and hateful within ourselves and within our society. Love demands that we be honest, vulnerable, and willing to extend ourselves for one another. As Bell Hooks reminds us, even just the possibility of love has the power to soften the sharp edges of our grief. A year and a half after my friend, my Valentine, Alyssa died, I stood at the top of a mountain in Cape Town, South Africa. To get there, I had used a passport for the first time in my life. I flew across the world by myself, having only been on a plane once before, and I coached myself through a hiking challenge that was way beyond my capabilities. However, the greatest barrier to getting to that mountaintop was the grief that weighed me down. That day, I stood on that high cliff, my heart pounding, looking out at rocky mountains, an untamed ocean, and a shining blue sky, a vista that is hard to describe because it is so breathtaking and so fierce. Cape Town is believed by many to be the birthplace of humanity, and it is a place that I dreamed of visiting since I read Nelson Mandela's biography in the fifth grade. Standing on that mountain, I was overcome with the feeling that Alyssa was there with me. I felt that she could see the world through my eyes. For the first time in a long time, I felt my heart fill with joy. I felt her love for me. She was proud of me. And I knew she wanted me to keep living, to keep following my dreams, to dwell in all that was possible for my life. I was transformed not by my grief, but by the love I received from all around me, the love within me I had yet to share. My life opened up before me, and I knew that this feeling, this life-giving love, is what I had been searching for for so long. 
my beloved spiritual companions. I know that so many of you are here today because you too have been transformed by love. Be it the love of a friend, a partner, a community, or the divine, love has transformed and continues to transform each of us. In this time when we are overwhelmed with reasons to grieve and to fear, may our hearts remain open to love. May it always be so. Amen. And now for our benediction, I want to invite you to try something a little bit different. Um, I invite you to rub your hands together, create some warmth, and then to place your hands over your heart, offering yourself love and compassion, honoring all that is lovable about you. Our benediction today comes from Catholic theologian Thomas Merton. Love is our true de destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with one another. Let, the, let, let us keep this faith and pass it on. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. I love you. Amen. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your are my people, your divine, my divine. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.